I'm a young black man Doing all that I can To stand Oh, but when I look around And I see what's being done to my kind Every day I'm being hard to this prey My people don't want no trouble We've had enough strong I just want to live God protect me I just want to live I just want to live How very good and pleasant it is How very good very good. And pleasant. Pleasant. How very good and pleasant it is. When kindred live. When kindred live. When kindred live. Together in unity. It is like. It is like. It is like the precious oil on the head. On the head. Running down upon the beard. Upon the beard. On the beard of Aaron. Running down. Running down. Over the collar of his robes. It is like. It is like. The dew of Hermon. The dew of Hermon. Which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there. For there. For there the Lord ordained God's blessing. God's blessing. God's blessing. Life evermore. If we say that we have fellowship with God while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. If we walk in the light as God is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and Jesus cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us pray together. Almighty God, hear your church as it makes its confession. We are grateful that in raising Jesus from the grave, you shattered the power of sin and death. We confess that we remain captive to doubt and fear, bound by the ways of darkness for we do little to turn our words into the actions of an Easter people. We have trouble sharing your grace with those who need it the most. We live as if Jesus was dead and buried forever. Forgive us, God of grace, 
as we step out of our shadows into your light. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness that we may live as your forgiven people. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sisters, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, sisters, let's go down, down in the river to pray. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, brothers, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, brothers, let's go down, down in the river to pray. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sinners, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, sinners, let's go down, down in the river to pray. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about robe and crown. Good Lord, show me the way. All oh, people, let's go down. Let's go down. Come on down. All oh, people, let's go down. Down in the river to pray. My little children, these things are written to you so that you may not sin. Anyone does sin, we have an advocate with God, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we are forgiven. Dear siblings, through Jesus Christ, the friend of sinners, we have received forgiveness, reconciliation, and peace. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. The Gospel according to John, 20th chapter, verses 19 to 31. Let us listen for the word of God. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you are retained the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. 
So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the door was shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. How do they keep putting one foot in front of the other when their whole pattern of life had changed? How do they keep going? What is there to say about the lives left behind? These are questions we might ask during this unique, anxious, daunting period of history with COVID-19. It's slowly taking a back seat and has made its way into more lives than we care to count. Just the other day, my 90-year-old mother with whom I live said, people are going to be writing about this for many years to come. What are we to say of these things? Isn't it curious how a personal experience can influence the way we read a passage of scripture? Because all the questions I just asked are the very questions the disciples are asking. Their beloved rabbi, teacher, master, and friend had died. But now the evening of the first day rolled around and, there, and they were, as one might say, cautiously optimistic. I mean, look at the text. The disciples were quarantined in a manner of speaking. They were holed up in a house with the doors locked. Thanks to our current circumstances, it puts us in a unique place to put us in that room in a different way. The disciples were fearful of going out, not for fear of a virus, but for fear of the authorities coming to get them. But it is fear nonetheless, and fear is something we've all become acquainted with in spades in these last months. And in the very first place, fear causes people to isolate. Where a year ago we might have said, all of us sooner or later will be touched by someone who has died of this virus. Now we've experienced it. On top of fear, the disciples' faith was tenuous. They were incredulous, even with the lead-up support of their master Jesus. They were filled with a mixture of responses. They weren't sure who they could trust. 
Could they really believe the wild words of the first responders? He is alive. They were wondering about everything. You can hear their conversation, can't you? It's like our conversation. We want it to go a different way, but it keeps coming around to the virus, to the way that it's affecting our lives. The disciples, their whole world was topsy-turvy. Sound familiar? And who sails in to stand among them? Who breathes upon them the Holy Spirit? Who brings the peace that passes all understanding? Jesus comes and stands among them and says, Peace be with you. It didn't mean all the fear was gone, but it did mean the disciples were in the midst of their beloved leader, whose voice they knew and whose presence they could see. Jesus' love language to his closest friends was this, peace, peace, I bring perfect peace. Not only that, Jesus' guidance is to send his disciples out to forgive sins. That is an awesome power. In other words, they weren't supposed to remain locked up in the room. Eventually, they would have to leave their sanctuary of peace to go out into the world and to spread God's love. Good news that had a whole new meaning now that they were in the presence of the resurrected one. Where do you find peace these days? Are you relying on the res resurrected one who can give it like no other? Do you find yourself in the presence of the holy and quietly tapping in to God's extravagant love? This is how one friend put it, writing encouraging words to our Centering Prayer group Cynthia Bourgeau, in her book, Centering Prayer and Inner Awakening, talks about Jesus radically squandering everything he had and was in extravagant generosity. May we, in our prayer, experience the infinite of Christ's love within us and the realization that it is ours to radically squander without reservation or judgment. Well, that's a very curious statement from my friend, isn't it? Do we also have the power to forgive sins as Jesus asked? Do, you under, do we understand that through him all are forgiven? Do we have the realization that the love of Christ is ours to radically squander without reservation or judgment? What do our partners, our families, our communities, our neighborhoods, towns, villages, cities, our state and country, and even the world begin to look like when we rise above fear and claim the love of Christ that is ours to radically squander without judgment or reservation. Most of the time, we walk around in our own minds with a dialogue of voices going on. I'm not talking about voices of hallucination, but voices from our past or voices of derision or a constant dialogue going on all the time. You aren't good enough to do that. Or who do you think you are getting all high and mighty that you might help someone? Or what do you mean love? Love is dangerous and risky, and you wouldn't want to do something that risky. Or, you're just nobody. Who do you think you could help anyway? These are the voices that do not sound like a radical squandering of the love of God. They sound like judgment, not only of ourselves, but of others. And friends, judgment is based in fear. We judge others to quell our own fear. Fear is used all the time 
to put others down in order to supposedly shore up our own ego. It's as old as the stars. And the disciples locked up in the room on the first evening of the resurrection had all those same voices going on in their heads. One of the purposes of the disciplines of the church and of faith is to help us put those voices to rest. As we find ourselves leaning on the everlasting arms of our Savior, we begin to discern between God's nudging, which leads to peace, and those old voices, which lead to fear and anxiety. And when we can't sense Christ's presence, then we put ourselves in the presence of others who can, until we can, believe again. Many a hymn stanza has been read and sung through tear-filled eyes, blinding our ability to keep going until we realize the congregation is singing for us until we can sing again. When we experience the deep peace of Christ, like the first disciples, we can subsequently venture out to radically squander without reservation or judgment the extravagant love of God. I hope you are hearing, reading, or seeing stories every day of those who are squandering the love of God. If you're not, change the station or turn off those technical, technological devices. Like, you know, take a technical Sabbath. Now, I'm not very good at that, turning off my devices, but I know when I have done it, it puts me in a whole different realm of peace because I'm not constantly being interrupted with dings or thinking about the next thing I'm supposed to say. No, leaning on those arms, those everlasting arms of peace. There are some extraordinary gifts that we can reclaim during this pandemic. And listening deeply is one of them. We experience the peace that passes all understanding by practicing being in God's presence through prayer, worship, holy conversations, and sacred spaces. Our offerings our forgiveness, our action, and our care of others can't be anything but radical and squandering when they are done with the peace and love of God at heart. The writer of 1 Peter put it so well. Listen to this as if he was saying it to you. What a God we have! And how fortunate we are to have God, the Father of our Master Jesus. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we've been given a brand new life and have everything to live for, including a future in heaven. And the future starts now. God is keeping careful watch over us and the future. The day is coming when you'll have it all, life healed and whole. I know how great this makes you feel, even though you have to put up with every kind of aggravation in the meantime. Pure gold put in the fire comes out of it proved pure. Genuine faith put through this suffering comes out proved genuine. When Jesus wraps this all up, it's your faith, not your gold, that God will have on display as evidence of God's victory. You never saw him, yet you love him. You still don't see him, yet you trust him with laughter and singing. Because you kept on believing, you'll get what you're looking forward to, total salvation. What? What an encouraging word. Total salvation, total healing and wholeness. We really need an encouraging word today. Don't we? 
You still don't see him, yet you trust him with laughter and singing. Amen. Let's do that. And, you know, when that anxiety and that fear comes up with you, in you, go to 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 9, and pray through that passage. Finally, being encouraged in Christ, it is our turn to encourage others. As we come to see, the early Christians grasped the covenant of God's way of living, following that if anyone was hungry or thirsty, naked or a stranger, sick or in prison, it is always Christ who cries to be clothed and welcomed. Christ whom one visits on a bed of pain or behind bars. It's the balance of the two great commandments, the law, that bring together the law and the gospel. The first one being, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And the second being, love sisters and brothers at least as much as you love yourself. Jesus declared that the second commandment is like the first. When you love brothers and sisters, it's like loving God. Members and friends of the Synod of the Covenant, let us strike a fine balance, for it will be in the balancing of the great commandment that our faith is made. And remember, Christ's love is ours to radically squander without reservation or judgment, because that is what he's done for us. To God be the glory. Amen. Hi, I'm Bryce Wiebe, Director of Special Offerings for the Presbyterian Church USA. I'm grateful to be with you, member congregations of the Synod of the Covenant, and grateful for your faithful participation in One Great Hour of Sharing, the Pentecost Offering, Peace and Global Witness, and Christmas Joy. On this first Sunday after Easter, I want to offer this reflection on Acts chapter 4. Let me read it for you here. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with a great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon all of them. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Here ends the reading. I think from the time I was little, when I always, when I picture God, I would always picture God wearing an apron, folding in eggs into a sweet dough like my grandmother to add richness that would darken to gold and then to brown, working the dough by feel, stretching and spinning and pressing these simple things to come together, to become more. The simplest of things, grains that become flour, touching a thousand lives along the way, the farms, the farm workers, transportation, grocery, and on and on. And so too eggs, the butter, the milk, sugar, a luxury, a dash of salt, a Bible lesson. The yeast, a little magic. The whole thing a marvel that it should come together right here, right here in her hands to feed you and to feed me. Because the first Sunday school lesson, that one about the God who provides daily bread, was the one I already knew growing up around apron strings. Whenever I imagine God and whenever I go looking, I come here, I come right here to the kitchen. Sometimes my own, where I 
learn how to put my hands to the task of feeding others. And sometimes, and sometimes the kitchens of others, where I touch again that first lesson, that every bit of food that I eat, that I consume, the stuff I need to survive comes so often by the effort and sometimes by the grace of others. And whether I'm willing to admit it or not, I'm not sustained by myself, but by a thousand silent agreements, cooperations, that causes this food to grow, to be gathered, to carry, to be cooked, and suddenly to arrive at my table. And that even that, even that network of connections and dependencies that I rely upon, relies upon creation's very rhythms, its cycles, which now lie in danger, and which were the gift, which are the gift, the one shaped in the kitchen on that first day, when God bent down to whisper a little magic, a little yeast, let there be. And so as a kid, it was those vacation Bible school servants in the kitchen, the women who made our snacks whose lessons I learned. While they served brown betties and apple pie and eight ounce glasses, Dr. Pepper. While I picked off the hot glued macaroni from my Moses craft we had made that day. It was holy what they offered. And so I recognized it again some decades later when those same women, many of them the same women, broad, strong, served ham and warm rolls and home canned green beans at my grandmother's funeral. Their upper arms more frail, but their hands still strong still ready. None of them had wealth or status, but they were practiced at being hungry and knowing how to feed people. They were practiced at mourning too and learning how to feed people in response to that. It was their offering. This bread they shared was how they communicated everything else that we shared. You know, it's always been profound to me that the first thing we should be asked to learn to share is food, the very thing we need in order to survive. How often do we hear it? Share your food with the hungry. And who isn't hungry, I mean, and who won't be hungry again? The report on the Acts Church in chapter 2 has them responding to the apostles' teaching with glad and generous hearts. Each give what they have according to what the other has need. When I think of special offerings, that's the image that always comes to my mind. That there are these chances that we as Presbyterians take to offer what we have in recognition to the need of others, of the need of others. So those experiencing hunger, disaster, and oppression are met through one great hour of sharing. That we support our children, youth, and young adults through the Pentecost offering active peacemakers through peace and global witness, and church workers and students at the schools and colleges equipping communities of color through Christmas joy. But you know, there's a subtle shift that we hear in chapter four, a shift beyond what we see in chapter two. They are one those first believers, united in every way. And all things are in common. No one considers what they own. Ownership, it seems, has been given up altogether. And with it, and with it, neediness itself. <laughs> this report, this report has the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is good news to the poor, suddenly becoming news that's so good 
rich people want to become poor, or at least risk becoming vulnerable to it. Those who have advantage surrender it as something that holds them apart, as something that keeps them from becoming part of the community they've been called to embody. With the action, with what they do, the need itself is repaired, rebalanced, redeemed. And this too might be what our offerings, all of them, weekly and special, are asking us to consider. Beyond just giving with glad and generous hearts in our sanctuaries across this country, but into offering into offering anything, everything that holds us apart, discreet, separate from those in need, from one another. Now I come back to the kitchen because frankly that thought is too big and too audacious for me to consider for too long. Can we risk giving up separation, advantage, owning? For their part, those early believers, they don't seem to have been able to sustain it. As we continue to read the story, greed returns. A few chapters later, there's an accusation of a failure to distribute the proceeds to the neediest among them. How can we, how can we learn again the lesson that they seem to have lost so quickly. I come back to the kitchen because it's where I was taught to practice it. To practice depending on others for the very thing I need to survive. And even if I would want to make believe that I earn every meal, I have to see the thousands of cooperations and connections that exist here that make that grain into flour to see all the people along the line, to see that I cannot eat without them, to look and see that they're able to eat too, and to see creation, to see creation as the fragile gift that it is, and to press my hands into shaping something I require as something that I'm required to share. Give food to the hungry, and who isn't hungry? Doing this, doing this helps me remember. I come back to the kitchen because it's where I glimpsed it. It's where I saw those women who fed me, and who taught me how to feed others. I saw that their gifts were not, were not compulsory or obliged, or even just expressions of largesse. They were the things that could nourish us. They were the things that could bring us together. They were the things that could show, or at least gesture, to the hope, the faith, the grief, the kinship, all the things we really shared. We are all hungry. We were all hungry. We would all eat together. And if we are not more equipped than that first Acts Church at sustaining at sustaining this type of giving. Perhaps we are just as capable of flashing it, of glimpsing it for ourselves. And that the gifts we make, our tithes, our weekly and special offerings, might help us practice, practice looking past just those we see in need to see the person whose gifts and determination, whose talents and skills and challenges are there to meet our own, are there as things to be given, not as an exchange of what we own, but to make a meal for all to eat. Perhaps it can be the start of a billion new silent agreements, of cooperation, of collaboration, where good news is for all people. Come and sit down, there's plenty to share.
oh God, you give us daily bread and you give us to one another. Grant that we would join in your system of justice and equity, of recognition and honor, of gift and creation, so that all will be fed.